Now let's face it, as a filmmaker like you and me, it's one of the biggest joys to create travel films. It's our opportunity to make long-lasting memories of our travels and to show another country or city from our own perspective. Not only that, cinematic travel film is a very famous keyword and gets a lot of views on YouTube. On the other hand, most of us started our filmmaking career with travel films, so those films were also the place where we made a lot of mistakes. When I look at travel films I created a few years ago, it makes me cringe. So don't worry if you're making those mistakes, we've all been there. Now, your goal should be to avoid those cliches as early as possible to improve your footage. So let me show you the five biggest travel film cliches you should avoid and what's the solution to that. Number one, applying creative LUTs before adapting your footage. I know. One of the highlights during the edit is to bring your footage finally alive with uh, some creative colors to give it like this cinematic look, right? But here's the error. Applying a creative LUT without color correcting and matching your footage first will look inconsistent and unprofessional. So better stick to the following workflow. If you recorded your footage in a picture profile like S-Log or HLG, you need to transform the footage first into your Rec. 709 color space. You can do it manually or use a conversion LUT. I use the conversion LUTs from uh, Leeming LUT, which work actually pretty good. If you need more info about it, check Gerald and Dan, who has a lot of good videos about picture profiles. Now do the basic color correction, to check for correct white balance, skin tones, exposure and contrast. In most of the video editing software, you have several tools for that, like Lumetri scopes, RGB waveform and the vector scopes to get the correct values. Going into detail here would blow up this video, so there are tons of videos on YouTube which take a deeper approach. In a third step, you should match the clips of your sequences. A good way to do that is to open up the color wheel and match tab. Now click the comparison view and you will see two clips next to each other. With your Lumetri scopes you can now match the exposure and the colors and saturation with the RGB waveform and vector scopes. Sometimes the apply match button from Premiere can even be a quick fix, but most of the time the software is overdoing the match. Now finally you can apply your creative LUT, but don't just apply the LUT without adjusting it. With the intensity slider you can change the intensity of the LUT. Like, Usually I start at zero and slowly increase until I like the look. Number two, forget to adjust the exposure correctly. Being in the hectic to capture the most epic shots on your journey, it's easy to forget about the correct exposure. But it's the one thing you cannot recover in post-production. Especially shooting with entry-level DSLRs like the Sony a7 III, you have very limited dynamic range and you'll really have to take care about the correct exposure. Once your highlights or shadows are clipping, you'll lose all the details or even have pure black or white areas in your image. When you're shooting in picture profiles like S-Log or HLG, you should also be familiar with the expose to the right concept. The best way to check the correct exposure is to use the histogram. Here you can see all your image information from pure black to pure white. Now try to move the mountain as far as possible to the right without making your highlights clip. So as soon as you have a steep cliff on the right side, you've gone too far. Another good tool to avoid clipping highlights are zebras. How to set up your zebras depends on your picture profile. With HLG3 the lower limit should be 99 plus. As long as you don't see any black and white stripes, you're good to go. Also. Try to make your life easy. Avoid harsh light during the day and try to avoid shooting directly into the sun with a dark foreground. Try to turn your camera a little bit away from the sun. Like standing in 45 degrees to the sun will still give you some nice backlight without having too hard contrasts. Number three, filming everything in slow motion. I'm seeing it all the time and I also did it myself quite a lot. I filmed my first travel film completely at 120 frames per second. Here you can see some sequences. Of course, your initial thought might be, ooh, nice, it looks so cinematic. But at least that was my first thought. Your viewer will feel completely disconnected from the people in your movie as it has nothing to do with how something looks in real life. It's a very extreme look. 
Like, use carefully and you can give the special moments in your film a very epic and eye-catching look. If you overuse slow motion, you will completely lose the impact and it will also take away from the pacing and fluidity of your story. Remember that less is more. Also, when you shoot in higher frame rates, remember to adjust your shutter speed according to the 180 degree rule to get smooth slow motion. So if you're shooting at 120 frames per second, your shutter speed should be at 240th of a second. Due to the higher shutter speed, you will also need a lot more light. In my opinion, a very good compromise is to shoot in 30 frames per second on a 24 frames per second timeline. Your footage will look less shaky and you will get this dreamy, nice look. The look is not so extreme and the movements still look realistic. Number 4. Overusing transition templates. When I did my first travel film and had a look at the final edit, I thought, Hmm. Somehow the transitions seem so harsh and somehow boring. So I looked for some transition templates and threw them on the timeline. I was actually amazed at how it looked, but when I look at it now, it makes me cringe. I'm not saying you shouldn't use those transitions at all, but the transition should fit your footage. If your clip doesn't have a lot of motion and suddenly there is a crazy zoom in triple turn to your next clip, it just doesn't fit and looks off best transitions are those you don't even recognize. So if you use pre-made transitions, they should only be like the salt in the soup to make it more seamless. The actual motive for the transition has to happen in the production when you move the camera in the direction the transition happens. For example, if you move your camera from left to right and you have the same movement in the next clip, then the transition will look purposeful. But the best way to cover your transition is to use more classic techniques which are used in big Hollywood productions as well, like L and J cuts, where you use sounds to transition into the next scene, cut on action, a match cut, or even a smash cut. Parker Wahlbeck did a very good video about the most used cuts and transitions in Hollywood. As mentioned before, less is more. If you use special effects on just a few cuts and purposefully, your edit will stand out. If you use it on every cut, it will be predictable and looks unprofessional. Number 5. Not stabilizing your camera. When done on purpose, shaky footage will underline and support fast movements in a hectic action scene. But if there is no action, shaky footage will be distracting and exhausting to watch. Of course, there are effects like the warp stabilizer at the tracker with which you can stabilize your footage, but it doesn't work all the time and especially the tracker can take a lot of time. So, better put in the work when filming. I'm not saying you need to buy an expensive gimbal. Instead, there are some easy and cheap tricks to stabilize your footage. Let me show you how. A good rule of thumb is, the more points of contact you have between your camera and your body, the better. If you hold your camera in one hand, far away from your body, it will be shaky for sure. Instead, hold the camera with both hands, very close to your body, and push your elbows into your body. If possible, do the movements without walking, like this, and use foreground elements to add more movement. When you have to walk, do the ninja walk, where you try to walk as smoothly as possible with very little impact. Another good tool is your camera strap. If you put it under tension, you have three points of contact again. For low shots, you can take a top handle. The heavier the camera, the better, as the inertia works for you. So try to add a little weight to your camera. If you don't have a top handle, you can use your strap like this. For indoor shots where you have a table available, you can use a towel or a cushion to slide your camera smoothly over the table. That's just to name a few. You'll find tons of other stabilization methods online. That's it. For me, five of the biggest travel film cliches you should avoid. What have been your mistakes which make you cringe today? Let me know your experiences down in the comments so we can all learn from it. So far, see you in the next one. Bye -bye.